Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. I'm David Tice, the World Bank's Press Secretary, and thank you for joining our virtual 2021 annual meetings press conference with World Bank Group President David Malpass. Mr. Malpass will give brief opening remarks and we'll turn to your questions. Incidentally, because he values transparency, you can also follow the World Bank Group President at David Malpass WBG. That's on Twitter at David Malpass WBG, and you'll find that on the chat as well. Uh, thanks to those who sent in questions in advance, and we will be looking for more questions online in real time. Uh, just for warning, we may edit for clarity or length, so appreciate your understanding there. I uh, hope everyone is keeping well. Mr. Malpass, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, David. Let me check my mute. Uh, okay, we look good. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Good morning from D.C. Um, I'm, uh, it, it's Wednesday. It must be D.C. and the annual meetings. I'm glad you're able to join. Uh, we're in virtual annual meetings, so there were, there were uh, full uh, run of meetings on both Monday and Tuesday. I've already participated uh, with the G24, with the parliamentarians, with CSO, civil society organization. I joined a meeting of the G20 leaders yesterday on Afghanistan. Uh, I've also met with Secretary Yellen, with John Kerry, the president of Colombia, uh, ministers from Mexico, Japan, Korea. Uh, I've welcomed their, the strong and growing support for a successful Ida 20. That's uh, important. So throughout the week, we'll be discussing a broad range of development issues, the economic outlook, growth, vaccines, debt, climate, uh, trade among others. Um, as you know, the world is suffering from a dramatically uneven recovery. Inequality is worsening across country groups. Per capita income in advanced economies is growing nearly 5% in 2021, but that's compared to only 0.5% in low income countries. And the outlook remains grim for most of the developing world. There's high inflation, there's too few jobs, there's shortages that extend to food, water, electricity. Uh, for example, due to the pandemic, uh, the, the factory and port shutdowns are going on in the bottlenecks uh, in logistics and supply chains are worsening. We see sharp increases in the backlog of orders. Our estimates suggest that 8.5% of global container shipping is stalled in or around ports. That's twice as much as in January of 2020. Um, these disruptions are placing sharp price increases on shipping fees and the final cost of goods, and some of them will not be transitory. Uh, it'll take time and cooperation of policymakers across the world to sort them out. Uh, as we look at development, the pandemic is pushing up the poverty around the world. It's already tipped nearly 100 million people into extreme poverty. That's the added number in extreme poverty. Um, we're witnessing a tragic reversal in development. The progress on extreme poverty has been set back by years uh, for some, for many people by decades, uh, by, excuse me, by a decade. Uh, and it's vital that we address this head on by redirecting policies in both the advanced economies and developing countries so that growth and investment are more widespread. Our highest priority uh, is to secure access to vaccines and speed up the shots in arms. Uh, I chair the Multilateral Leaders Task Force, which includes Kristalina, Tedros, and Ngozi. Uh, we, we had a good public discussion yesterday, uh, and we'll soon be holding our fifth meeting of the task force focused on uh, matching the extensive pledges and trying to have actual vaccinations come out of the pledges that have uh, that have been given by the uh, advanced economies. There's got to be a way to close that deployment gap. The World Bank is able to finance uh, the doses and the deployment, uh, but there needs to be uh, early delivery schedules. So we're urging governments that have sufficient doses to swap early deliveries uh, to allow more vaccinations in developing countries. And we're urging the finance ministers and health ministers of developing countries to enter contracts in order to get 
deliveries early as, as soon as possible of vaccines. And we're working with countries also to reduce the hesitancy to encourage the vaccination of people. The, uh, our, our observation through the task force and through, uh, uh, through our country programs is that when the countries are able to get vaccines, people are, are being vaccinated and the vaccination rate is going up consistently when the supply is available. Um, the, the World Bank's support for the poorest countries is at an all time high. We're working to help countries secure more doses, deploy them. Uh, I was in Sudan and Jordan uh, where I witnessed uh, firsthand, this is uh, now two weeks ago, seems like uh, yesterday, but uh, I, and I witnessed the vaccination efforts uh, and they're accelerating and we're, I'm, I'm pleased. The World Bank now has a 250,000 doses under contract with bank financing and those deliveries will be going on uh, in coming months months and that's very important for saving lives. Uh, I want to mention another couple of priorities and then get, uh, turn to your questions. We're, the, the debt challenges are confronting many countries. On Monday, we released the annual IDS report uh, and it showed 12% increase in debt for the low income countries reaching $860 billion. Uh, we need new systems to push that along because so many countries are in external debt distress or at high risk of it. Uh, we need a comprehensive approach, including debt reduction, swifter restructurings, and more transparency in order to make progress on this problem. <clears throat> With uh, the Ida 20 replenishment in December, African heads of states have already called for donors to be ambitious in their support for Ida's mission. Uh, the financing needs are urgent. They'll remain elevated for years and a successful Ida 20 is, uh, is vital. Uh, we're, we're moving toward the, uh, the conclusion of the Ida 20 fundraising effort in December in, in Tokyo. I met with the, with the uh, deputy finance minister yesterday and we're, we're pleased with the progress. We're very pleased with the strong support worldwide for a larger Ida 20 uh, replenishment. Um, resources will be a topic this week and we'll also need to be active participation uh, with uh, public and private sectors. I mentioned my meetings with parliamentarians, with CSOs, uh, and uh, with, we, we're, we're meeting regularly with foundations, indeed the whole international community in order to, to help bring the resources to bear on the range of uh, uh, challenges, including vaccines, debt, and of course, climate change issues. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I have received a note, I must have said, 250,000 doses, but I meant 250 million doses, a quarter of a billion doses are under contract by the World Bank uh, that, that can, with countries, through country financing programs. And we are working as hard as we can 24 seven to uh, expand that number uh, as soon as we can get uh, doses and delivery schedules from the advanced economies and from the manufacturers. Okay, with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thanks all, thanks David. Great, and plenty of questions on screen already. I see the first in is from Yolanda Morales of El Economista in Mexico. Mr. Malpass, World Bank experts used to suggest to strengthen the efficiency of public spending to promote growth and support development. How do we make public spending more efficient in a country like Mexico? Uh the governance processes are important. How do you make your budget? Mexico has a, a system of elections that's that's welcomed by the by the world that allows uh, there there to be a choices made uh, by people through the system that can always be strengthened as as we see around the world. Uh, and then governments and and the system, the people's input into the spending uh, needs to be thinking about what's best for the people of Mexico. There's got to be a balance uh, and and uh, of 
of health, of education, in particular education at the primary school level is vital. Uh, the World Bank keeps track of the human capital index, which is the which one one part of that is how many children by age 10 can read a basic story. Literacy is one of the most important building building blocks for for future growth and uh, success for economies. So it's got to be it, there needs to be funding either in the public sector, the private sector, some way to get that moving. Teachers are vital. I just uh, uh, spoke to the to the uh, on the International Teachers Day, which was a week ago, on the importance of teachers in classrooms. Uh, so that's just one of many, many uh, priorities. Um, uh, Mexico and other countries need infrastructure, and some part of that is a public-private partnership where the public sector does an effective job of contracting. Uh, and so I emphasize this whole range of good governance to have. Uh, solid contracts, good choices. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in Washington D.C. today, and I'm a U.S. citizen. I work for the World Bank, but I'm aware of uh, the challenges facing the U.S. budget process. Uh, I started my career. Uh, in government with uh, on the staff of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee in 1984. And those issues, uh, the, the, the exact issues of Yolanda's question were paramount uh, in 1984. How can the government uh, spend efficiently? And it's a big challenge uh, around the world. Um, I, I just urge uh, politicians and the people of countries to recognize that when when they when the governments make spending choices, it's coming from the resources uh, that the people create. So it should be used wisely. Thanks. Thank you. And next question coming in from uh, Fiona Harvey of the Guardian, who sent a question in advance. I recently interviewed Lord Stern, the former World Bank chief economist, who said climate finance provided to developing countries by the World Bank should be doubled in the next few years. Will the World Bank commit to that? Uh, we have a 35% target for all of our spending, uh, for all of our commitments, which is a high target. It's aggressive, so we're moving up from the 20, from the 20s into the 30s, and uh, on average. We are committed to reaching 35%. That won't be the doubling that was mentioned, but it will be big increases in, in dollars uh, because of the, the expansion of the World Bank uh, Commitments Book. Um, in addition, we can add to that through private sector mobilization, ways to bring in the private sector. And I think also people should recognize, in addition to the spending uh, by the World Bank, which is, which is uh, are, are, is at record levels and moving higher. And it's uh, the, the World Bank alone spends um, more than half of all the multi, multilateral development banks. Um, and so it's a big number already. Uh, but we should also put heavy emphasis on the results. The key thing for countries and for the, the climate change uh, 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 progress uh, is to identify large greenhouse gas emitters and help them reduce their emissions. So it's the results of the projects. And one other point I'll make, David, so uh, I know people want to focus on how much did you spend, but I want to focus also on what did you get, what were the results for it? Because otherwise it's, it's a lot of talk about spending, but not that much about the results. So we should talk about the results. And then I think we also have to talk about the project pipeline to achieve those results. Uh, the World Bank can, we are working with countries on their indices, uh, which are which are important. Uh, and then how does the how does each country, uh, the, the developing countries that we work with, uh, how do they set up their, their economic plan so that it incorporates climate change in that? And then how does it, how how does it actually have projects to decommission coal plants or to use cleaner fuels than what they're using? A lot of the developing world is burning bunker fuel in order to make electricity and with no plan to uh, terminate those contracts. And so that's that's an immediate challenge. It's not uh, it's not so much the money uh, as what are the results that you're seeking to achieve? And is the country on board? Do they have a plan to do it? And how does the whole world help them? The World Bank can help design that. Uh, and we're doing that with our new country climate development reports. Thanks. Thank you. A uh, question now coming in from Ghana, from Julius Kofi with Business Fiber newspaper. 
In view of the many opportunities available to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, as mentioned in our latest African polls, what is the World Bank's willingness and readiness to support countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially Ghana, to take fully take advantage of opportunities presented by climate change and to support climate uh, private sector investment? Thanks for that question. Those are core areas of World Bank, uh, uh, the, the mission. So the mission is to reduce poverty and to increase shared prosperity. That means median incomes should be going up. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they haven't, they have, they are lagging way behind uh, the advanced economy. So we have this inequality problem. So core to, to core to making progress on that is uh, improving the private sector uh, capabilities of countries, including Ghana, uh, working with governments to identify the, the uh, strengthening that could be done that brings in new investment. And a, a chunk of that new investment can come into climate uh, related issues. There needs to be efficient, uh, clean energy uh, and plans so that there can be more electricity with less carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, that's that's a core goal of the of the uh, of the greenhouse gas reduction uh, agenda, and also land use uh, and ways that there can there can be protection of biodiversity, which uh, which acts as a carbon sink. So we're working throughout Africa, in practically every country on the climate agenda alongside the development agenda, uh, recognizing uh, that, that countries, in order to be fully engaged, countries are going to need to see uh, development as part of their outlook. Uh, and that, that means a lot of thought. Uh, World Bank can help supply the global knowledge for that, uh, but also and leadership by the countries in moving in a good direction. That means toward cleaner fuels, uh, that means toward a plan that gets uh, expanded electricity access, clean water access is actually a critical part. And w water itself is a critical part of the climate agenda because uh, in, in many cases in countries, there are subsidies that are being done for, for economic activity that's harmful to climate efforts. And this is uh, very clear in the water area where, the, where crops are grown in areas that may not be the best for that kind of crop and it misuses the water uh, and it, it water itself. Uh, for example, flooding of, uh, of rice, uh, rice crops uh, causes uh, a large emission of methane. Those can all, those, that, this whole dynamic of the world needs to be thought through from the standpoint of, uh, of bringing together development and climate change. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next question coming from Gabriel Yin of CGTN in China. How does the World Bank see the role of young people in global climate action? And how is the World Bank empowering the youth to take climate action? Thanks. Thanks. Um, incentives are really important country by country. And so one of the challenges that we're facing, if you identify well, a problem that's going on in climate action, it's that huge subsidies are going in the wrong direction by countries. They're subsidizing fossil fuels. They're subsidizing uh, the mining of coal and the burning of coal. They're subsidizing uh, farmers that are, that are, uh, that are uh, digging up uh, carbon sinks uh, in order to in order to uh, plant crops that are subsidized by their governments for export uh, and so uh, a starting point for for this is to uh, identify the subsidies in countries and also I, I think we need to look at the at the price of carbon, at taxation of carbon, and also some some kinds of systems, so that there's incentives that go in the right direction. Young people are aware of, of incentives, so there's there's a joint action, so people can understand what the challenge is. So that's good, uh, but. Uh, and people uh, wake up in the morning and they react to incentives that are within their country structure. And I think there's a huge amount of progress that needs to be made in that area. Um, technological change and entrepreneurism are, are important. Uh, I was in, as I mentioned, Sudan, Jordan. I was also uh, in the West Bank um, and uh, met with in each place with young people, with entrepreneurs and their ideas. And what I'll just mention is 
is the world is changing because of digitalization. I think this should have, and it should be designed so that it's very positive from a climate change aspect. People, young people are doing that, they recognize that. And so to the extent that we can have digitalization penetrate more, it helps uh, it helps uh, across the board from the economic growth standpoint because it has so many side positive effects in terms of the information that people have available, their ability to interact with the global system, all that's improved in, a, in, a, in general in a carbon friendly way. Thanks very much, great. Next question is from uh, Egypt. We've got Doha Abdul Munin from Ahram Online. What kind of support the, has the World Bank been expending to the MENA region, including Egypt, to boost health systems and make them more resilient to shocks like COVID-19? And a related question from Jafar Sadaga at uh, Palestine Youth Agency. Just wondering about your recent visit to the region. Thanks. Got it, thanks. Um, what, what, uh, a core part of it is our COVID-19 response program. So what we did in uh, uh, March and April of, 29, of 2020 was design a new fast track system within the World Bank that could push through a lot of programs. So we've reached near the, the point where we have uh, nearly uh, 150 programs around the world, including heavily in the MENA, MENA region that allows the provision of healthcare basics uh, that are financed by the World Bank through grants and through very low interest rate loans. And that extends even, for example, to Iran, where we work with the with the United Nations so that they can supply uh, healthcare uh, uh, needs into Iran, but it's uh, particularly in uh, uh, in the uh, in the rest of the MENA region. Also, we do vaccination programs uh, in in uh, many of the countries. We and we've we've worked with and encouraged Egypt in in contracting, but uh, we have programs in Jordan and others where they uh, they have the World Bank has helped finance vaccines. That's true of. Uh, with Lebanon, they were one of the early ones. It was problematic to try to have a system that was fair and equitable to distribute the vaccines once they've been uh, uh, brought under contract. So I just mentioned those two, and in West Bank and uh, in the West Bank, um, where I was maybe one week ago, uh, and this is on, on, on Twitter, you can read uh, some of the remarks that I made in meetings that I had, very interesting set of meetings. And one, one, one uh, uh, project site that I visited there was the water treatment facility in Hebron, uh, which is interesting because it can help uh, the West Bank save money and it can help uh, uh, save money because there, that, that uh, wastewater is being treated now in, uh, as, it, as it moves into Israel. So it's being treated by Israel. And so if, if it can be treated more in the West Bank, uh, you get cleaner water in the West Bank and a reduction in cost. So it's a cost effective kind of a project. I also met with Israeli officials in, Jer in Jerusalem uh, and it was very interesting as it, well in both Jordan and, and in uh, uh, Israel, uh, the countries would like to see the West Bank doing better economically. There's there's a lot of fiscal challenges uh, and debt challenges in the West Bank and also in, in Jordan uh, that can be met by uh, stronger country programs. External resources are important. Jordan, uh, if, if I can turn to that, is, uh, is working with the Syrian refugee inflow that came in and they're providing uh, flexible, they're providing uh, a system and World Bank working very closely with Jordan to help provide a social safety net and a, and a, a system of uh, work permits that can operate even as people are receiving some benefits through the government systems. So there's a recognition of the burden uh, on, on Jordan of the, of the refugee challenge, of its uh, responsiveness and of, uh, of, a, of a global responsibility to try to help with that situation. So the World Bank is helping with that. In Egypt, we're working on, on various uh, country programs that would in, increase the productivity. Uh, Egypt faces challenges in the, uh, in the agriculture sector, in the logistics sector, in the tourism sector, in electricity, that are that they're, they're, they're making progress on, we're working with them on, and I think there can be more, 
more uh, uh, focused effort that will extend to healthcare as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next question we have in from Lali Jha from the Press Trust of India. Lali asks, what is your impression of India's economy and recent steps taken by the government of India to reform? And um, how has the pandemic impacted India's support? Thanks. You're on mute, David. Say the question once more, David, sorry. David, now I can't hear you. You're on mute, sorry. Oh, dear me. Um, Lolly Jaffa from Press Test of India is asking, what is your impression of India's economy, recent steps taken by the government of India to reform that economy, and how has the pandemic impacted India's poor? Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank, thank you. India was hard hit by the, by the waves of COVID, and that's uh, unfortunate. They responded with a huge production of uh, vaccines, and there's been uh, progress on the vaccination effort. But we have to recognize the, uh, the hit that uh, COVID caused on the Indian economy and especially on, on uh, the informal sector of the Indian economy, which is large. Um, I, we must have, World Bank must have put out a new GDP forecast for India. I don't, I don't have it with me, but uh, the Indian economy is recovering and we welcome that. And so it's 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 going through to the other side of the COVID uh, of the uh, the of the latest wave, uh, and so that's good. Uh, but India, like other countries, is hit hard now by the supply chain disruptions and by the inflation that's uh, that's been rising in the world. So I guess I you know I'm giving the general mixed view that there's progress, uh, but not enough. Uh, and India faces huge challenges of uh, of integrating more people into their into their economy, into the formal sector economy, and raising the earnings of people. The government's been focused on that, uh, so I I I can't today. I, I went to India in uh, late 2019 uh, and saw changes that were being made that were quite positive in terms of the uh, the banking system, the financial system, the, the civil service uh, system, and ways that and, and India was looking for ways to improve the the uh, clean water, the water situation, which is which is very important in India for child nutrition and for uh, uh, for for improving uh, uh, nutrition because uh, uh, clean water is one of the most important starting points for life. So I'll mention that, and there, the, the, this is a huge, uh, giant challenge for a, a the world's biggest democracy. Thanks. Thank you very much. And our next question comes in from Cameroon, actually, from Guzero Gapayo of Liberty Press. Mr. President, beyond COVID-19, the economy is suffering from real and constant damage. Have you thought of measures to save companies in difficulty? And if so, what are they? And, and this is particularly relevant given the supply shock. So one of the things uh, uh, hurting the world right now is the companies that were small companies in logistics. You can think truck drivers, but small trucking companies, they went, many went out of business uh, in, the, in the pandemic. So that's really challenging because it's hard to form one of those businesses. You need to put together some equipment, uh, some contacts, meaning who's your route, who do you work with? Uh, one of my first jobs in the 1970s was with a trucking company uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the uh, setting up that system is one of the biggest challenges in, in economics because it, uh, computers haven't been as good at doing it. People have to be involved and you have to bring them back to work. So I, I, I went on on that because what, within, um, in May of 2020, we recognized this was going to be a big problem. IFC took some, some uh, particular changes in its operation to, uh, to uh, expand its trade finance business. One of the challenges within logistics is how do you do import export transactions if the banks are closing down that, that route? The correspondent bankings were closing down uh, and the uh, and trade finance was closing. Uh, and so IFC was able to double that business uh, rapidly. I think in 2020 and into 2021, we're continuing that program in MEGA now. MEGA and IFC are working on a joint or have, have launched, are, are uh, doing transactions in a joint 
mega IFC trade finance uh, operation. Small uh, credit to small and medium sized businesses is also vital in all of this. And one of the things that we are uh, that are we are attempting and working to expand is to have uh, systems or or uh, uh, have a, uh, a transaction uh, possibility that will help banks uh, uh, exit. Their, some of their loans, some of their safer loans, and that allows the banks to take on more small and medium-sized business loans. If I can digress a minute, this is a giant problem in the in the advanced economies because the central banks are using bank loans in order to buy long bonds that are safe bonds. So it's the opposite of the direction that we need to go in order to improve small business finance. So in, in the developing economies, we're try, to, trying to uh, go in the other direction of having banks uh, be able to sell or to reduce their safe loans, and that creates space on the balance sheet of the bank to to take to find small business loans, which are the lifeblood of job growth for these economies. Thanks. Great, thank you. Pivoting now to Morocco, we have a question from Hisham bin Jamal of La Vie Echo. Uh, the populations developing countries have been hit hard by the consequences of COVID-19 and uh, assistance granted by the governments have been minimal or even non-existent. What lessons should developing countries draw from this health crisis, particularly on the social level? This is a little bit like that very first question on how do governments spend money uh, uh, well, uh, and especially when the world is uh, it descends and says the number one thing is vaccinations for COVID uh, or is uh, is climate change, where the country is looking and seeing, wait, we have these huge social needs uh, in terms of uh, the general healthcare system, maybe vaccinations for for other diseases. Those have been. Uh, uh, those have declined because people are not having as much connectivity. They don't go to the rural health clinic as much as they did in the past, and they miss their vaccines, and children have missed vaccines. So I really want to urge uh, people in developing countries to do their checklist of nutrition, of, uh, uh, of, of a range of vac vaccinations, and if COVID vaccinations are available, that too. Um, so. Uh, another area that I mentioned, David, in my opening was the uh, was the debt situation. So, in in starting in March uh, of 2020, I called for and was joined by Kristalina of the IMF, uh, Georgieva, um, the, uh, for a moratorium on debt. Um, the G20 adopted a debt suspension initiative, I, I guess, in April of 2020, and then deepened it with the Common Framework in uh, late in 2020. Uh, but this this is not creating creating as much fiscal space as the countries need. The debt burdens are high, unsustainable. As I mentioned, the IDS data that just came out early this week from by the World Bank uh, shows the dramatic increase in debt uh, in debt levels and the unsustainable unsustainability problem. So these are these are major challenges facing the country because it takes up fiscal space. So I really want to urge us to move forward more on the common framework, uh, find more ways to make it effective. Uh, I'll be meeting with the G20, uh, uh, I guess today, finance ministers, and it's an important discussion in the G20 of how to make the, the uh, common framework uh, uh, more effective so that there can be more fiscal space in countries for the range of good spending that they need to undertake. That's a, a, a wide range, nutrition, education, health, infrastructure, climate, uh, climate related activities toward cleaner fuel and toward adaptation in countries that, uh, uh, that are facing uh, climate change challenges and, uh, and 12 more, uh, you know, uh, uh, 50 more high priority items for people in Poor countries. So I, I think the world should help by focusing on more resources. I is a critical part of that. And by debt relief, uh, the common framework is a critical part of that. And then by countries doing, uh, uh, and the private sector bringing in huge amounts of new resources in order to fight these problems. Thanks. 
Thank you for that answer, which actually goes to the, the next question, which was from George Biaf of Joy FM in uh, Ghana. So the next question, which we will close with, is actually one that uh, touches on what you were just talking about, but if, but perhaps a little more detail from Maolin with Jinwa. You mentioned the pandemic would mean setbacks in poverty reduction, especially in low-income countries. How can the World Bank support those countries' efforts, and are there enough resources? Uh, yeah, th th thank you, and that's really good to close on. It's not it, it's not just poverty; it's the backsliding on uh, women, on vulnerable, on children. Uh, these are these are uh, 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 um, tragic um, setbacks uh, due to the pandemic and due to the global slowdown, the closures, and now due to the to supply chain disruptions and the inflation. So it's and 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 debt among them. So the World Bank is responding with resources. So we in in the in the 15 months ending in June of 2021, we uh, committed 157 billion dollars of of financing uh, that. Uh, uh, that helps uh, countries. A lot of it, uh, a chunk of it, is in grants. Uh, there's a lot that's zero interest rate loans and, very, and then very low interest rate loans to help countries uh, have better development outcomes. That's the core uh, mission of the of the bank, uh, and we use the tool, and I want to again uh, reiterate the importance of IDA within this. It's replenished normally every three years. We accelerated that because of COVID, so we're doing a, a hurry up a, a, uh, uh, that, that is vital for helping countries with vaccines, with, uh, uh, with their healthcare systems, uh, and with poverty reduction. So now to, let me turn to the bigger core of that question. Uh, that the, We're talking about uh, a, a reversal of development. And one part of that is the poverty numbers are going up. And so how can the World Bank interact with that? Well, uh, we can identify country by country where the where the, the uh, reversals are occurring. It's, it's broadly around the world. And then it, it, uh, try, what we can do is identify uh, ways that the world can do better on these problems. I've, done that in my uh, Sudan positioning speech. I'll be speaking uh, today at the G20, uh, also tomorrow at the IMFC meeting. We, you know, we've got the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank this year, this week, which is bringing together uh, finance ministers from around the world and, and also world leaders. Uh, and so I think we, w the world should be asking leaders, how, how can this be done better why are so much of the resources going to the upper end? Why is median income going down, not up? Uh, and what what aspect do policies play? Um, you know, if I can, I'll, I'll criticize and then compliment. Uh, the, to criticize, we've got a system that's clearly guiding resources toward the upper end. That's the central bank system, and that's also the fiscal systems of the advanced economy. So those need to be rethought and changed in a way that causes, uh, that allows growth uh, at the, at the, at by small, medium-sized businesses, people that are, that are looking for a new job, get them in, uh, placed into a new job, especially in the developing countries. In Jordan, which I, where I was a week ago or so, the youth unemployment is nearly 50%. So there needs to be a system of, uh, of global, uh, of international finance uh, that is better suited toward uh, people getting jobs in the poorest countries in order to reduce the poverty rate. And then in the developing countries themselves, uh, better policies in order to allow uh, state-owned enterprises to be less uh, dominant. That's We talked about Egypt a little earlier. That's a major challenge. The economy is dominated by state-owned enterprises. And so we work to try to say, can there be boundaries? Can there be oxygen uh, for, for new businesses to set up? Because they'll be the ones that create the most jobs and bring down the poverty rate. So I'm going on a little bit, David, but I think there are, on, on the positive side, there are, I've met recently with 
new presidents from around the, from many countries that are really working to change their country. I met with the president of Tanzania that needs to really dig out of the COVID pandemic and move forward. I met with the new president of Ecuador who is uh, uh, in, a, in 100 days, they were able to vaccinate every uh, those that wanted to be vaccinated by allowing the vaccines to go to companies. And then the employer had a huge self-interest in order to have the people of the country be uh, the, their employees be vaccinated. So it accelerated the vaccination process using the incentive structures of the country. There's, there's a self-interest of businesses in having their employees be vaccinated when they want to be vaccinated. Uh, and so that's one powerful tool. And we could think about that worldwide. If we can harness incentives in the right direction, that will give us a way forward out of this, uh, uh, this uh, reversal in development. Thanks very much. Thank you, David, very much. And this will conclude our press conference today. In case you missed it at the top, you can also follow David Malpass on Twitter at David Malpass WBG. And um, he also posts low form opinion pieces on LinkedIn at David R. Malpass. Thank you all very much. Have a great day and a good meetings. Thank you. Bye bye.